Hey guys, so we're about to wrap up our exploration of Lament, and this is our last episode, and I want to kind of just take a minute to sit with four different laments, four different lamenters, and what God did in their lives. Because ultimately, anything that we do, that we study about, that we that we think about, that we attempt to experience, it's all part of spiritual formation. In other words, you can expect your transformation if you follow God into obedience and lament. Let's take a look at the corporate lament of Nineveh. We can find this account in the book of Jonah. You guys may be familiar with this from our series in Jonah, but the Ninevites were, well, they were, they had quite a reputation as violent people who uh, attacked and, and even went just beyond the kind of standards of warfare at their time, but they really sought to humiliate and dehumanize their enemies, uh, transporting them other places, defiguring their bodies, all kinds of crazy stuff. Really quite a notorious city that thrived on this violent display of subjugation of their enemies. Now, Jonah visits them reluctantly, uh, and God has a message for them. So we're going to look at that. Here is the, the opportunity to lament. One of the ways that we can lament to God is in the context of our own sin. So if that's where you're at, just pay close attention to Nineveh. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, rise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out to it in the, the proclamation that I am telling you. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the, of the Lord. Now Nineveh was a great city to God the length of a three-day journey. So Jonah began to come into the city for one day's journey, and he cried out, saying, Another forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed God, and called for a fast, and wore sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Now, this is remarkable. They lamented in repentance immediately. They found out they were out of sorts with God, and as a whole, they came to God in repentance. Let's see how this goes. The word of the Lord reached the king of Nineveh, right? If anybody uh, was going to remain prideful, it would be this king, right? But what did he do? He rose from his throne, took off his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat in ashes. He made a proclamation saying, And Nineveh, by decree of the king and his nobles, no man or beast, herd or flock may taste anything. They must not graze nor drink water, but cover man and beast with sackcloth. Let them cry out to God with urgency. Let each one turn from his evil way and from the violence in his hand. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn back from his burning anger so that we may not perish. Guys, this is significant. Uh, th this display of lamenting, they are truly lamenting their sin. And, and, and the, the king is inviting everybody, hey, have everybody fast, have everybody throw on sackcloth. This is lament. This is an act of mourning. And, and what, are they, what are they lamenting? What are they mourning over? They're lamenting their sin as a, as a people. And guys, we've been coping uh, and, 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 and trying to understand this kind of disparate response we've seen in our country to our nation's turmoiled history. And let me just offer this. Corporately, I believe Nineveh offers us a way forward. Uh, that the, the corporate, this whole people group, uh, even in, a, in almost comical fashion, right? They're throwing sackcloth on the cows and making them fast too. It's, it's almost comical, it, it, but, it, but it's hyperbolic. It shows the sincerity of their lament. They see they're out of sorts with God and they go to great lengths to correct it their relationship with God. And what do they do? They turn to lament. We're doing this as spiritual discipline, so we expect transformation. What happened to Nineveh? Lament into repentance. God responded. That's what we believe about spiritual discipline and spiritual formation. Is this something that, that God stirs in us? And when we respond to him, God is responsive. Let's return to Jonah. When God saw their deeds, that they had turned from their wicked ways, God relented from the calamity that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So guys, we can turn to lament when we're faced with the crushing realities of our own sin as individuals, as a people group, as a nation, as a church, as a, as a youth group. That when we find out there's something out of sorts with us and with the, what we associate with, we can turn to lament in repentance. 
learn from Nineveh that this spiritual discipline, this act of trust in in voicing uh, our complaint to God and, and, and throwing ourselves in submission to him, it can be done as an act of repentance. And it can provoke change, true change in your life. And God will meet you there. What if it's nothing that you've done wrong, right? What if it's nothing that you, you feel like, like, like it's God maybe that, that is, you're going to challenge, right? We've talked about this with the laments that they, that they actually complain and, and even uh, chastise God. Well, that's what this guy does, Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a prophet that wrestles with the reality that God's coming judgment for generations of sin in Israel is going to come through Babylonian uh, destruction. That this 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 nation uh, to to the north and, and to the east of of Israel is going to come down and going to destroy Israel. As a prophet, he's privy to this. He understands what God is doing, and he's mad about it. He doesn't understand it. And he he turns to lament in protest about what God is doing. So, whereas Nineveh went to God about something that that they had done wrong, Habakkuk turns to God when he perceives God making a bad decision. So, let's wrestle with that. O Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die. O Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O Rock, you have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? God, do you not see what's going on? What does God do with Habakkuk's honest thing? Uh, Habakkuk is almost challenging God like, "This, this isn't you, right? You wouldn't do this. You wouldn't send the Babylonians, would you? And what does God do? Again, we're going to expect our transformation. God replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Moving forward, the cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around you and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed human blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood come to life or to lifeless stone wake up can it give guidance it is covered with gold and silver there is no breath in it the lord is in his holy temple let all the earth be silent before him so what god does is he 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 kind of rallies some evidence to his defense right you guys have been violent and so as just God, I'm, I'm going to bring my judgment upon you. You guys have turned to wood and stone. He's referencing idolatry that Israel had begun to worship and then continued to worship uh, gods made by their own hands, leaving him. See, he marshals his, his own defense in a sense. And then he says, the Lord is in his temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. So God has spoken. God is going to do this. So what transformation can this provoke in Habakkuk? Habakkuk is saying, in in protest, God, don't do this. Why would you do this? Why would you punish us with the evil Babylonians? And God is like, because I'm just and there has been injustice. So be silent. So what does this provoke in Habakkuk? Chapter 3 introduces his prayer, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, on Shigonoth. On Shigonoth. What? Shigonoth, uh, shig, uh, ah, la, la. Shigonot, I think I'm saying that right, Shigonot. It's actually uncertain what it is, but, but some people have conjectured that it's a passionate song, uh, an animated song of lamentation. It's a protest song. But what does this protest song sound like? What, what is actually happening to his heart in the protest? Well, let's find out. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. 
though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes in the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights for the director of music on my string instruments. In his protest, uh, uh, that what God is doing, it's its not, again, like Nineveh, it's like, uh, we did wrong, and Habakkuk is like, God, are you doing wrong? And what Habakkuk is saying is, I- I'll trust you. When God responded, Habakkuk, Habakkuk is changed. God responded. He, he marshaled his defense, and he, he invited them into silence. And what does Habakkuk do? Habakkuk picks up his stringed instruments, and he expresses his trust in God. His soul, in some way, has been silenced, right? He's, his heart's pounded, his lips quivered, his bones are decayed, my legs trembled, yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity. He has come to accept something that God is going to do. Habakkuk's heart is changed. He has been formed, spiritual formation. He's, he's been changed by the discipline of lament. He brought his complaint to God in protest, and he finds himself accepting the hard realities of what's to come and God's justice. And in that protest, we can find trust in God, a silence of our souls to accept what God is going to do with our lives and the lives of those around us. Let's read about another lamenter, and this guy's the classic one, Job. You guys may be familiar with his story, There's this cosmic thing that happens. God and Satan are talking and God gives him permission to, to, to kind of ruin Job's life. And, and God kind of says, I I, I don't think he's going to curse me. And Satan is like, no, I'll get him to curse you. I'm going to, I'm going to make his life a mess. So, uh, Job doesn't know all of this is happening. He actually never, uh, gets an answer about that. We as readers have privy to the, this divine drama unfolding, but the guy loses his, his family, his possessions. He, he's robbed. There's a storm and his house collapses and kills his, his, his children. And everything is taken from him. his wealth, his family. And, and he's sitting in, in sackcloth and ashes. He's lamenting. And his wife, his friends, they all come and they invite him. Basically, like you either did something wrong or you need to curse God because God isn't fair. And what Job does is he laments. This is an ancient Near Eastern uh, literary uh, genre called the theodicy is what scholars call it today. It's essentially a- answering the question: uh, How can a righteous person suffer? Uh, what is happening? Is is God and, and the general patterns of God's um, uh, kind of promises of blessings and obedience? How does that apply with someone who hasn't done anything wrong, like Job, and is yet still suffering? With Nineveh, we're talking about what do we do with our own sin and how do we lament that in repentance. With Habakkuk, it's a perceived um, unfairness or, or, or confusion about what God is doing. And so there's protest. And with Job, uh, we see someone who is really struggling with grief. And, 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 it's, and it's the circumstances of his life. And did, did he deserve this? Did he do anything wrong? Is there any offense in him? That, that, so, so he's coping. He's, he's struggling with grief. And we can come to God in lament when things are, are around us that, that, that really are challenging. Losing people we love, losing friends we love, all of these things. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, may the day of my birth perish and the night that said, A boy is conceived. That day, may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. May gloom and utter darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm it. That night, may thick darkness seize it. May it not be included among the days of the year, nor be entered in any of the months. May that night be barren. May no shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day those who are ready to rouse the leviathan may its morning stars become dark may it wait for daylight in vain and not see the first rays of dawn imagine cursing your own birthday Uh, have you ever felt this way in grief about something that's happened in your life let's continue for it did not shut the doors of the womb on me to hide trouble from my eyes why did i not perish at birth 
and die as I came from the womb? Why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? For now I would be lying down in peace. I would be asleep at rest with kings and rulers of the earth who built for themselves places, now lying in ruins with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not hidden away in the ground like a stillborn child, like an infant who never saw the light of day? There the wicked cease from turmoil, and there the weary are at rest. Captives also enjoy their ease. They, they no longer hear the slave drivers shout. The small and the great are there, and slaves are freed from their owners. Why is light given to those in misery and life to the bitter of soul? to those who long for death that does not come, who search it for it more than the hidden treasure, who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave. Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For sighing has become my daily food, my groans pour like water. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. Job is saying the grief is so strong that he wishes he had never been born and he wishes he wasn't alive. That's how strong this grief is. Have you ever been there? Guys, what does he turn to? He is lamenting. This is lament, the spiritual discipline of lament. He directs this to God. He's sitting in sackcloth and ashes and he is lamenting in un believable, unbearable, crushing grief. If you read the book of Job, and it, it's long, there's this long dialogue between him and his friends. And it's a great drama, and, it, and, it, and it's challenging to follow the line of thought. But essentially, his friends invite him to probe, did you do something wrong that deserved this? And Job was like, no. Why is God doing this to me? I don't understand. Now, because Job is doing this in direction to God, this is his prayer, God responds. It begins in chapter 38, and we're going to bridge over to chapter 42 in a moment. The Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, after all of this long theological conversation about what God was up to, here's what God's answer was. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and the angels shouted for joy. Do you see what God is doing here? God's, God's response invites Job to say, you can only know so much. You are not God. You do not understand all of the reasons for this. God never explains to Job what the readers have privy to in the opening scenes of the book. God's saying, you can't understand all of it. You're not me. And for Job, this is enough for a man of faith. Here's what Job responds with. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes, and he gave him twice as much as he had before. Moving forward, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. So there was something that happened within Job. Something broke, and he continued his lament and, his, and even repentance. And he doesn't fully understand God, and yet he chooses to hold on to him. And to respond to him. And what does God do? God blesses Job's life. So I, I don't begin to claim that I understand the full message of the book of Job. It's a really challenging book and a lot of people have chewed on it for a very long time. And I would encourage you to read it. But what I see here is the contours of lament when the grief is unbearable. 
turn to lament. God will speak to you. Even if it's an answer that you don't fully understand, something will happen in your heart and change your perspective on your situation. And for Job, humble him and, and, and restore uh, something that he had, a confidence in God. You can lament when the grief is too big to bear. And I believe that will change you. God will meet you there and something will happen. Now, let's look at one other lamenter, and this one might surprise you. We hit on this a little bit in our last exploration, but Jesus, did you know that he lamented? We're going to take a look at a lament in the book of John. We have Jesus weeping over Lazarus. And for those of you who that name rings a bell, Lazarus, you'll remember something about him. He came back from the dead. Why would Jesus weep before that? Isn't Jesus the life and a resurrection? Because... Jesus laments for other reasons as well. So let's take a look. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. This the teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her there, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her were also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. I believe that's the shortest verse in the Bible. I'll read it again. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him but some of them said could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying so let's pause here for a second jesus is the resurrection and life we heard that we know that he has the ability to bring people back to life we, we see that the people around jesus are, are, are beginning to believe this and yet jesus wept jesus fully experienced the suffering the loss he knows it. He's in solidarity with you. This man was his friend. He, he, he's sad seeing the tomb. And I just want you to hear this, that there's something going on here in the discipline of lament that Jesus gives us a model for. What is God doing here? What is God doing here embodying the human experience of lament? Well, let's see. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, Martha said, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor. He's been in there for four days. Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of lemon, a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Do you see what's happening here? There's something else going on in the discipline of lament, and I'm thrilled by it. Jesus bothered to feel the full weight of the grief. Jesus, who could call this man forward from the grave, wept. And I would say with us, with the people grieving the loss, with people accepting the realities of death, 
Lament is necessary. Jesus did not move forward. He didn't say, it doesn't matter the man died. I'm the life and the resurrection, and it doesn't matter. It matters because Jesus wept. And when Jesus wept, he lamented, he grieved, he mourned, just as any other human would do. And past that, that lament, past those tears, past that period of mourning, there is hope because he is the resurrection and the life. Because lament is an act of hope. We can lament in hope of the resurrection. That yes, uh, the, the, the picture we have in heaven, that, that God wiping away every tear, do you know what that admits? It admits that there are many tears to wipe and that what we are going through right now is worthy of those tears. Have you let yourself feel them? Have you let yourself grieve and mourn what is happening? I was listening to the radio uh, before preparing for this, and we've reached over 400,000 deaths for COVID-19. And we've talked about all the other issues we could lament, the political unrest, the racial injustice, the things that are happening around the world that grieve our hearts. Let's feel it. Let's weep. Just because we believe in the resurrection of life doesn't mean we should pretend that what's happening around us isn't happening, because it is. Jesus didn't pretend it didn't happen, but he went through it. He went through it in tears and in hope. So would you lament and hope what has happened to us and to those around us and to those we love and to those we don't even know? Lament can be a way forward and to the hope of the resurrection. We come through tears to reach the joy of the resurrection. So let's Let's grieve together. Not faithlessly. Let's not grieve without the context of, of, of Jesus. Let's not grieve without the context of, uh, of this resurrection hope. But let's grieve because of it. Because what we're experiencing, the death around us and the decay and, and, and the brokenness, it's real. And on the other side of that, the resurrection is real too. So be ye encouraged, O brothers and sisters. Take heart through the discipline of lament. So guys, if you're feeling the weight of your own sin, look to Nineveh. If you're feeling the weight of a narrative, of a corporate uh, participation in a story of sin, look to Nineveh. Lament in repentance. If you are upset at the sins of others and and you're not sure why God would allow this to exist and and you have this prophetic uh, angst about you, look to Habakkuk and you're not sure why God isn't going to put it down or why doesn't he put it down the way you wanted to put it down, look to Habakkuk and lament and protest. If you are crushed by the weight of, of the grief around you that the loss and the mourning and the tears are so heavy, you're not sure you want to be alive or that you ever wished you were born. Look to Job. Look to the lament of him to to navigate this this infathomable God and and, and how he allows injustice and, and, and tragedy to exist, and yet he knows exactly what he's doing and he's with you. Look to Job's example and lament in your grief. And... We look to our Lord and Savior, the one who bothered to know human tears for himself, who experienced loss. And we looked to Jesus in his lament that he did not skip over the tears and the funeral before he looked to resurrection hope. We will meet Jesus there too. Jesus is at the funeral. And he really cried. And he really wept and he really felt loss. It's real. And yet, through the tears, Jesus demonstrated hope and the resurrection. Let lament change you. Let this spiritual discipline, this act of prayer, of protest, this act of, of prophetic complaint, this act of, of, of unbearable uh, grief, this act of, of, of change of heart and repentance, let it all be directed. Let the floodgates go and, 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 and let, let yourself feel 
all of it, and bring it to God. And we can expect our transformation. God's going to do something with it. So whatever awaits us in the year ahead, and whatever we're still unpacking and will be unpacking for a long time about what's happened to us, in repentance, in protest, in grief, in hope, go to God in the discipline of lament and be changed. Godspeed.